Good day. This is Word Harriman, AE6TY. Today I'd like to look at using SimSmith to do some timed domain reflectometry using just the impedance files which you can get from your VNA. SimSmith is a platform. Yes, it does Smith charts and SWR charts and power charts, but it also can do waveforms. And we can use it as a programming platform to implement other algorithms. Here's a typical waveform. It's a sine wave coming out of the generator. It is just at the fundamental frequency. Here is the instruction that I use to plot a waveform. I simply say wave and the name of the signal. And SimSmith always displays two full wavelengths of the fundamental. Now, it's not always the case that you want a pure sine wave. There are times when you want something else. So, for example, one might want a square wave. And SimSmith allows you to specify the harmonics of your generator waveform. In this case, we're using a square wave or an approximation of a square wave. And down here, you can see the harmonic statement, which is saying it's got zero DC. It's got amplitude one at the fundamental, one third at the third, one fifth at the fifth, one seventh and the seventh. And as you add more terms, this waveform will become more and more square. Now, how can we leverage this? Well, let's think about time domain reflectometry. In this case, we're using a pulse and we're going to send a pulse into the circuit and we're going to see what reflections come back out of that circuit. Now, if the circuit is perfectly matched, there would be no reflection. If the circuit has a place where there is a lower impedance, than the transmission line, for example, there will be a negative going pulse. And if there's a place in the circuit with a higher than Z naught impedance, there would be a positive going pulse. Most of our VNAs don't do pulses. But then again, neither does SimSmith. But we can use the harmonics command to synthesize that pulse. The first thing to notice is I've moved the sine wave to be centered at the middle of the display. And in order to do that, I had to phase shift the fundamental. In this case, I phase shifted it by nine degrees by saying that the amplitude of the fundamental harmonic is one and its angle is J or 90 degrees. So let's make a pulse. Simple enough, a pulse is all the harmonics phase aligned and with unity amplitude. So here I have 1J for the first harmonic, 1J for the second, 1J for the third, and I just keep going. And as I add more and more harmonics, this becomes narrower, narrower in pulse, and the ripple down here becomes less. It gets tiresome to type all those 1Js, so we're going to use SimSmith's programming anvil to write a little program. And the little program is for I, an index, one to whatever size I might choose, add a harmonic of 1J divided by size. And we put in the divided by size so that this pulse doesn't get taller as it, we add harmonics and make it more narrow. So here's a case where I picked the first 256 harmonics. You can see the pulse is fairly narrow. It's pretty flat over here. It's got this ringing. It's very common with digitally synthesized pulses. So how can we use this? Well, we're going to send a pulse from the generator into this circuit. And we'll do a fairly simple circuit. Here we have a 45 degree transmission line with the impedance which matches the generator. 
And then I have another transmission line here whose impedance does not match the generator. And as we said earlier, a positive going pulse means that the impedance increased at some point, and a negative going pulse means that the impedance decreased at some point. So as I walk across here, I'm going to put the pulse in. It's going to hit here, and there's going to be an increase in the impedance, so I would expect to see a positive going pulse. And then it will come through and hit this 50 ohm resistor, which is a decrease in the impedance, so I would expect a negative going pulse. So here's our input pulse. Here's the positive pulse as the impedance increased, and here's the negative pulse as the impedance decreased. Not all time domain reflectometry uses a pulse. Sometimes you can use a square wave. The advantage of a square wave is it gets you some idea of the time involved and the relative impedances. Although you can determine that from the pulses, it's easier to see with a square wave. So here I changed this second transmission line to be shorter and I used a square wave coming out of the generator. And if you'll notice here, here comes my square wave. And again, it's going from 50 to 75 ohms, so I would expect a positive going pulse. And then it goes from 75 back to 50, so I would expect a negative going pulse. The interesting thing about this is if I compare the time of this pulse and this pulse, or this edge and this edge, I get 45 nanoseconds between those two. My velocity factor is one, which is roughly a thousand feet per second. So that would tell me that whatever happened here would be a transmission line, which was half of 45 feet, something like that, which is about what we have here, 22 and a half. And believe it or not, I didn't rig that. That's actually how it came out. Now, you'll notice that all we've really done is dropped a pulse into here and watched the reflections coming back. In fact, what we did was we looked at the impedance here and computed a voltage and plotted this waveform. Here, I've taken out that transmission line, or that pair of transmission lines, and written the impedance seen by the generator, I wrote out into a file. And I brought that file back in down here, you'll see. So again, we're going to do the same square wave going in that we did before. Here's the program that wrote the square wave and use just an impedance file. And the impedance file is exactly what you would have gotten out of your vector network analyzer. And you'll notice that lo and behold, the answer is exactly the same, which is not surprising. Now, there are some other ways you can do this. As I said earlier, SimSmith has a general purpose programming paradigm in it. And one of the important things that SimSmith can do, obviously, is to read impedance files. A less well-known feature introduced recently in the SimSmith is the Fourier and the inverse Fourier transform, specifically, I should say, the discrete Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform. Now, why does that matter? So what are we doing? Well, we're really taking frequency indexed set of measurements, the impedance file. And we need to turn that into a time-based measurement, which is our waveform. And this conversion from frequency to time is exactly what the inverse Fourier transform does. So here, how can we use SimSmith's inverse discrete Fourier transform? It takes a little coding here. I put it up here. I'm not going to walk through it except for a couple of points. The first one is that I needed to convert the impedance into a voltage. And that's done with these lines right here. I take the impedance into a temporary variable. And then I do a 
classic voltage divider here, assuming my internal impedance in my generator is 50 ohms. This is the voltage that I would see looking into the circuit. And I add that voltage to a list. And then I pad that set of measurements to be however big I want it to be. And I can set this to be quite large. And if I set it large, this pulse gets narrower and narrower and narrower. So I read in the file. I create an array which contains the voltages as seen at various frequencies. I pad it out to be however big I want it to be. And then I run the inverse discrete Fourier transform to get the IFFT, which is in fact my waveform. And right down here, you see I plot my waveform. This little statement right here is so that I can shift it over some and keep it off the edge of the display. Well, it turns out that it's relatively easy to make that impulse waveform that you saw using the uh, inverse discrete Fourier transform. It's somewhat more difficult to do the square wave version, but only slightly. And I leave that as an exercise for the reader. The hint is that the impedance file measurements, or those voltages we use, need to be scaled using the discrete Fourier transform of a square wave, which sounds complicated, but we've already seen that. This, remember where we saw 1, 0, 1 3rd, 0, 1 5th, 1 0, 1 7th ad nauseum. That is, in fact, the discrete four-day transform of a square wave. We've already seen it. This is just for the mathematically inclined. It's not complicated, but it doesn't really lend much to this paper. So wrapping things up. Well, SimSmith can use the wave and the harmonics commands to implement time domain reflectometry. It can use VNA impedance files as fodder for the TDR. Do a measurement, you can run TDR on it, nothing special from the VNA, nothing special for you as a user. You simply need to, to write that little piece of code that does the TDR for you. SimSmith can also use the Fourier and the inverse Fourier transforms to do essentially the same work. So if you wanted to implement a little block that could do this for you and would not require editing the harmonics or the voltage waveforms coming out of the generator, you could make a little daemon block that does this. And so with a little programming, SimSmith can be used to explore a variety of algorithms beyond the basic Smith chart, SWR, and power transfer problems. I should mention that all of these programs are in the SimSmith samples zip file that is distributed along with each release of SimSmith. If you, if you go up here to help, you can fetch this zip file. And one of the things that we'll provide is, is this directory, which kind of has lots of things in it. In this particular demonstration is in the TDR subdirectory. And here's all the files that I use and all the circuits that you've seen and this presentation. This is Ward Harriman, AE6TY. Thanks for watching. Thanks for using SimSmith.